Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that this story, that it will, the hard parts and the wonderful parts, will bring meaning and give us deeper understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the other day I was uh, having a conversation with a member and we were talking about this reading, and he shared something with me that helped, I think, all of us think about the understanding, an understanding of our readings today. He told me that he doesn't like driving at dusk for a simple reason, because at dusk, there's not yet enough darkness for the light to be of that much use. Friends, for the light of Christmas to truly make a difference in our lives, we need to see the darkness. The darkness in this story, and darkness that can pervade the world in big ways and in small ways. Today in this story of the wise men and Herod and Jesus' family, we get both this wondrous light, the Bethlehem star, and we also get the worst darkness imaginable. But it's in that contrast that we find that our vision is immeasurably enhanced. We can see better because of the contrast. Now, something we want to see and acknowledge about the Bible is that it is not, it does not try to create a cocoon or a bubble, and it's often very blunt, and maybe never any more so than today. We begin with this lovely light of that original Bethlehem star, and guiding the wise men to the original crash, that beautiful scene. And in the first part of the story, the first part of it, we hear about the wise men and how they inform King Herod that they had come to meet this one who was going to be known is the kingdom of the king of the Jews, the newborn baby, the king of the Jews. Now we get hints in that first part of the story that of how King Herod, who was the Roman appointed ruler over all of the Jewish people in Palestine, we get hints in that first part of how threatened he felt by this child who was being he was being told was going to be a king. But it isn't until the second part of the story that we get the full impact of, Her of King Herod's paranoia. In what's known as, the church has known this, known, used this phrase throughout, virtually throughout its history, what's known as the slaughter of the innocents. We see Herod's murderous fear, we see it play out. wise men, they don't report back to him after he, they found the family. They go home by another way. Herod decides, you heard it in the reading. I almost don't even like to say it. He decides to have all of the children under age two put to death. I believe this is the most disturbing story in the entire Bible. Now you might think that the evangelist Matthew would have tried to cover our eyes from this story. After all, it's not a very good start for the long-awaited Messiah. But from the early days of the church, instead of averting our eyes, the church is actually lifted up a special day. It's actually the fourth day of Christmas to, to remember these children called the Holy Innocents. Why? Why does the church do this? Again. Because to appreciate the light, we need to see the darkness as well. To understand the human potential for evil. This season we call Epiphany, which runs until Lent, is about celebrating the light of Christ. That light manifest in the world. And to really celebrate it, we need to understand that this baby was sent to us 
because of the problems of the world, because of sin. Acclaimed Connecticut preacher Fleming Rutledge, she very bluntly puts it this way. If it were not for the ugly part of this story, Jesus and the angels and the shepherds might have had no more significance than Frosty the snowman. And she continues saying that this story also reminds us Christians that we cannot run from the suffering of the world because it's part of the story. It's part of the human story. However, however, there is very good news here as well. As we see in the life, death, and death and resurrection of Jesus, the ugly part of the story, it's not the end of the story. Similarly, this reading prompts us to ask another important question about faith, which is, how can an almighty Lord allow this kind of suffering and tragedy? A question that has driven many people away from faith. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I've got some sort of a simplistic answer. What I'd rather do this morning is share what I believe. And so let me try to put it as simply as I can. Because it is complex in many ways. I could not believe in a God who is not right now. At this very moment, holding those children, those holy innocents in his loving arms. In other words, I believe in eternity. Which means that the story does not end with the Herods of the world, that God is watching, that God is involved, and God is judging. And that God is still, no matter what we see on the ground, that God is still in charge. And while, yes, of course, God gives us a gift of freedom, of free will. And with that gift can come chaos and serious problems. We know that. But in the midst of our problems, God also asks, asks for our trust, especially when things are not as we want them. And in this way, God expands our vision, expands our horizon. And so the story does not actually, it does not end at Christmas. Christmas is just the beginning of a story in which Jesus teaches us to love, teaches us to calm, to stay calm, and to do it. Gives us the tools to do it through loving our neighbors as ourselves, to do the often hard work and patient work of love. And this is a story, by the way, that doesn't also, it doesn't end on the cross. It doesn't end on the cross either. It's a story that ultimately points to more life and more love. Not easy to explain, I know. Perhaps, perhaps other than through sharing stories. This week, as our church, our emergency response fund, we're looking for, always looking for new ways to engage in the wake of storms. We've talked to, talked to a bunch of different organizations, including this week I talked to the Presbyterian Disaster Assistant, someone, a man up there at that group. And he, um, uh, a PDA is what it's, they go by. And the hurricanes, talking about the hurricanes in Central, the things to be done in the hurricanes, after the hurricanes in Central. America. And it really was a very good call and learned lots of stuff, ways that we can engage as a church through our emergency response fund. And, but in, in follow-up to that email, in follow-up, I should say, to that conversation, he sent me an email. And it was, and, and I, I looked down at the bottom of the page. I, I'm not sure why. I looked, 
maybe my eye was drawn to it, I saw this, this phrase, out of chaos, hope. A wonderful motto for after any storm, including this past week's storm for our nation. Lynn and my, our good friend up in Brooklyn, 96-year-old Grace, who I've talked about from time to time, she sent us this week an essay that she just wrote about her faith that begins like this. When I was eight years old, my mother took my brother and me to California to visit our grandmother. We had a great time. The most amazing aspect of the visit turned out to be my visit to Sunday school. The teacher was a charismatic woman who took one look at me and said, with a conviction that has stuck with me my entire life, she said, God loves you. Knowing that made me so joyful, I skipped all the way back to Grandma's house. That was the beginning of my abiding comfort in my personal relationship with God. Not long after that, Grace's mother died. And then years later, during World War II, <clears throat> when she was pregnant with her first child, her husband, the soldier, died in the war. Think. Think of the uh, abiding comfort <coughs> that she felt during those times, knowing that God loved her so much so that she's still talking about it, still writing about it at age 96. The other day, I was talking with a woman who, we were talking about our reading. And she reminded me of something. Reminded me today not to neglect to point out that God's light was in the second part of the story. The angels delivered. They helped deliver the holy family. And this woman also reminded me that her son had died on Epiphany some years ago. She also reminded me that she too is counting. She's counting on that light being in her story and in her son's story now and eternally. On 9-11, back when I worked on Wall Street, and lived, we lived across the water in Brooklyn. In the aftermath, of, the aftermath of that day, the whole thing was a blur. As was our worship service at our church that night. But I remember one thing especially clearly from that service. Our hymn that night, the opening hymn. Oh God, our help in ages past our hope for a year to come, our shelter from a stormy blast, and our eternal home. Years later, at that same church, long after Wall Street days, when I became a pastor, I remember the first baptism I ever did. And I remember the words, I still use the words today, but I remember saying these words over baby Teddy. Edward Teddy Wilson, as I was putting water on, on, his, on his forehead. Edward Teddy Wilson, child of God and son of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are marked and sealed as God's own forever. Friends, we are children of God, now and forever. And when we trust in that, it helps us through any stormy blast. Whether it's this 
past week or any week. And when we trust that we are all children of God, it also changes how we treat each other. Whether it's this past week, 2,000 years ago, or tomorrow. Remember, remember that the God who loves that eight-year-old little girl, Grace, as she's skipping home, is the same God who loves each and every one of us.